Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you and all glories to assembled devotees. Uh, Guru Maharaj, at the moment we have 15 participants. Um, so <clears throat> should we begin now? I can always begin with the invocation, yeah. Today's subject matter is the occasion that we're honoring today is the disappearance of His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So uh, we'll be speak. that'll be the subject matter for today. <laughs> and so we'll begin. Kumagyan, Timedandasya, Gena Jana Salakaya, Chaksu Unnalitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurvena Maha, Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna, Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gaurvani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyati Rezatarine. Umdeham Siguro Sri Yuta Padekamalam Sigurum Vaishnavamscha Sirupam Sagujatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha in my own Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Shri Makti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine, Shri Varshavana Videvi, Dayate Kripa, Daya Krishna Sambandha Vigyanam, Daya Nepa Vaveda Mahama, Dur Ojwala, Premadhyaya, Shri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Da, Shri Gaura Karuna Shakti, Vigrahaya Namostate, Namaste Gauravani, Shri Murtaya Dinatarine, Upanuga Virura Pahansitan Tatwan Tarine Namo Gorika Shodaya Saksad Vairagya Murtaye Vipalamba Asambo De Adambo Jayate Namaha Namo Bhakti Venodaya Satchit Anandan Namine Gora Shakti Sarupaya Upanuga Parayate Gora Vibhava Bhumes Tvam Nir Desesha Sajana Priya Vaishnavanam Vaishnavat Vitar Vaishnavana Vitar Shambhu Let me see, let me see again. Uh, yeah. Jagannathas Babaji Te Namaha Panchakalpa Taru Bhizja Kripa Sindhu Pei Bhizja Patitanam Pavanagyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaha Namaha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchina Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Vikavanu Sati Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jaisi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 <clears throat> so, yeah, we're a little low on numbers here. Let's we'll begin anyway. So, uh, I'll cover three different areas of the topic. Today we are honoring and remembering uh, and uh, glorifying uh, the spiritual master of Srila Prabhupada. His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti, Siddhanta, Saraswati, Thakur, who was an empowered incarnation, Chaktavesh incarnation, who came to bring Lord Chaitanya's teachings all over the world. <clears throat> it was by his strong desire that uh, Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master, went around the world, went around the world to establish Lord Chaitanya's teachings. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had commissioned his disciples to go to foreign countries and establish Krishna consciousness. 
he sent people to what was now then known as Burma. Now it's Mayana, Mayanar. He sent them to London, England, sent them to France, sent them to Germany. But everyone came back without any real tangible results as far as establishing anything. Mm -hmm. Although they had some programs, met some important people, got some accolades from the local governments, but nothing really transpired into some established development. It wasn't until our spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, went to the West, it actually things started to actually develop around the world in Krishna consciousness. But it was spearheaded, fortified, and encouraged by His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. His life is monumental. It's, it's a treatise in itself. There are, there's one major work written by uh, uh, my god brother, Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, wrote a very, it took him 22 years to complete it. It's three huge volumes on the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Well documented, amazing accounts of Bhakti Siddhanta's life, his teachings and uh, what he established. <clears throat> and there's a smaller version, which was the first to come out. It's called Raya Vishnu, also by the dear godbrother, Guru Vilas Prabhu, who wrote Raya Vishnu. So those two, uh, we recommend devotees to read about the life of Bhakti Siddhanta because his teaching, his um, it might be very difficult to understand Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, so we don't really recommend to study his works, but we understand we should at least study his life. His works can be understood through Srila Prabhupada, ardent spiritual master. But there are many things that he wrote that are interesting. I'm going to read one today, which I think might be uh, uh, relevant to everyone. It's called the process of initiation. You get an insight of what initiation really is. But before we do that, I'm going to re talk about some of the, in a PowerPoint way, mention some of his uh, activities in his life. Let me see here. So I'll read some, some things in the life of Bhakti, Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Um, at the time, prior to his appearance, there was a lot of asampradayas. His father, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was probably the only stalwart Vaishnava to really try to reestablish. It was actually Bhakti Siddhanta who tried to reestablish Lord Chaitanya's teachings, which had been lost for at least 150 to 200, 200 years after there was a large gap where there was everything was lost and then gradually in the mid 1800s all the way to the time that he departed in 1914 he really worked hard to reestablish Lord Chaitanya's teachings this is a great history by studying the life of Bhakti Siddhanta and Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Prabhupada, you can get a clear understanding of Lord Chaitanya's mission and the history that uh, unfolded the present day mission. Uh, there were many asampradayas. Sampr a, a means not, or means not bona fide. 
So there were lineages of people who were claiming to be followers and teachers of Lord Chaitanya's movement, followers of him. Some were even claiming to be family members. And so uh, there was a lot of, there were 13 major asampradayas going on. Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur worked very diligently, wrote many books, preached as much as he could, tried to inspire uh, the actual truth of Lord Chaitanya's mission and his teachings. But he was a lone ranger. So at one time in his life, this was in the early part of his life. Um, he prayed, my dear Lord, please send me someone from your personal entourage. Please some, send someone from your personal entourage to preach the message of Mahaprabhu. Little did he know that that prayer was answered in the form of his son. And so on February 9th, 1874, at 3.30 p.m., according to the Indian calendar time, uh, a child was born who was the fifth son of Bhakti Bhakti Vinod. He was born in Jagannath Puri, which means that to be born in Jagannath Puri means to be born as a very, it's, a, it's probably the highest birth you can get on this planet. There's nothing higher than that. And uh, his name was Bhimala Prashad. And uh, Kedar Nath Dutt was Bhakti Vinod Thakur's name. And therefore his name was Bhimala Prashad Datta. And it was interesting. When the child was born, they noticed something really quite amazingly unusual. The umbilical cord, which connects the mother to the child, was wrapped around Bhakti Siddhanta, or we might we say little Bhima Prashad, like a Brahmin thread. It was like he had been born with in a Brahmin thread. So the, the cord was wrapped in the same way. And then after taking him to an astrologer, they found that there were 32 auspicious signs in the child's chart, which indicated that he was a Mahaparush, a great personality. <laughs> when uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur was actually the magistrate of the Jagannath temple, and he was working to organize the offerings and the timings of the offerings, which had been lost due to previous uh, uh, administration. So he became commissioned to work there. So he was living there. And you can still see on Grand Road where the, where the uh, carts go down Grand Road, the place where Durathi Archer takes place every year in Jagannath Puri, is the house of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, where Bhakti Siddhanta was born. And it's now it's an actual temple with deities. It's a very holy place. So it was his mother, when her father, when her husband was away, Bhakti Vinod, she took the child. And it's just interesting because the cart, the Rathiyatra cart ceremony was going on. The little Bimala was only six months old. When the car just happened to stop right in front of the house where little Bimala Prashad was born. So his mother, Mother Bhagavati, she took the child and brought it on the cart. And she placed him right at the feet of Jagannath. And while the child was there, something amazing happened. The huge garland that was around the body of Jagannath fell from Jagannath's body and landed in a circle around the child. Later on, when his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, returned, his mother, Bhagavati Devi, 
she told him what happened. Then, right then, he understood, oh yes, my prayer has been answered. This personality that I pray for has become my own son. Uh, after 10 months, they moved to a place called Ranagat in Nadia Bengal. There's an interesting story when he was four years old. Um, it was mango season, and there were many profuse mangoes available. And so his mother would keep mangoes to be offered to the deity. But one day he took a mango. He was only four years old, and he took a mango and was eating it. His father saw that and said, what are you doing? Said, oh, this is for the deity. We shouldn't do that. We can take after it's offered to the Lord, not before. So uh, the child didn't know, but he realized, oh, I have committed an offense. And so his entire life, he took a vow at four years old. At four years old, he took a vow never to eat mango in his whole life. Interesting. And he kept that vow throughout his whole life. And many times during mango season, someone or maybe his disciples would bring him a nice mango to eat. He would say, oh, I cannot take, I am an offender. So throughout his whole life, he never ate a mango feeling even at the age, of course there was no offense for a four-year-old child, but this is how serious he took it. At the end, age of seven, he memorized the entire Bhagavad Gita. When he was going to school, he never read the books that he was supposed to read for school, but yet he got the highest marks in the class. He would spend all his days in the library reading the books in the library instead of the school books. <laughs> but still, he came out top in the class. At the age of seven, his father gave him a deity of Kormadev, and he worshipped that deity. At the age of 11, he invented a style of shorthand called Picanto, which was later adopted as one of the principal, not principal, but one of the styles of shorthand. Also at the age of seven, his father gave him Tulsi beads and taught him how to chant the Maha Mantra along with the Shringa, the Shringa Mantra. At the age of 16, he began to study his father's books and he also wrote books on astrology. Um, he published one book later on called Surya Siddhanta which was an actual astrological treatise, both on astronomy and astrology. Uh, sometimes people would say, well, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta was an astrologer, so we should read and study astrologer, astrology. But Prabhupada used to say, our spiritual Prabhupada, yes, but he gave it up. <laughs> He was offered many important positions based on his work. That was in 1897. And he was he's still a young man to about 23 years old. Uh, but he refused wanting to spend his life studying scripture. At the age of uh, 16, he also started a group in school called the August Assembly. And the group was meant to study scripture, but one of the qualifications for entering the group is that one had a promise. <coughs> Excuse me. One would have to promise to uh, take a lifetime vow of celibacy. Uh, of course, some, in the narrations of this particular incident in his life, it was, un, it was understood that he was the only one that followed that vow. At the age of 18, he entered college. And this is when he studied all the philosophy books in the library. 
He became expert at all the six branches of Vedic knowledge. At the age of 21, he left college because he was getting pressure to get married. So he didn't want to get involved like that. Uh, so at the age of 23, he wrote that Surya Siddhanta. In 1898, he, the family moved to Swananda, Sukada Kunj. And this is right near where Bhakti Vinoda Kaur's present house is. Bhakti said Bhakti Vinoda Kaur would hold discourses and Gorky showed that Babaji Maharaj would come. In the year 1900, he took initiation from Gorky Sir Das Babaji Maharaj. Babaji Maharaj tested him to see how sincere he was. And Gorky Sir Das Babaji Maharaj accepted him as his only disciple. He received the name Sri Varshabhanavi Devi Daita, which is a name in glorification of Srimati Radharani. Um, there was one Babaji who was a famous scholar. His name was Radharaman Charana. And later he broke away from the tradition of Vaishnava and he concocted his own Rasa Basa Mantra. Bhajanitai Gaur Radhe Sham Japa Hare Krishna Hari Ram. <laughs> And he was propagating that. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who was now Varshavana Devi Daita, challenged Radha Raman Charana. But that didn't turn out too good because some of his disciples were threatening Bhakti Siddhanta for doing it. And Bhakti Vinoda Kaur told him to stop. So but he, even at that young age, he was very much strong to, to notice what was not actual Vaishnav philosophy or Vaishnav practice and speak out strongly against it. He had the, uh, later on, after he became Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he was given the title Nishringa Guru, <laughs> because he was like a lion. Sometimes he would see Mayavadis and uh, impersonalists and he would become angry and he would chastise them really strongly. So after some time, he got a reputation as known as, as the lion guru. And when the Mayavadis would see him, they would go the other way. <laughs> They would walk in a different direction if they noticed that he was coming. In 1904, he toured South India, collected information, and on the rights of the Vedantic Tridandi Vaishnava Sannyasa, he did that mostly from the from the uh, Sri Sampradaya. He studied the Sri Sampradaya. At 1905, at the age, of, the age of 31, he went to the yoga pit in the place of the parents of Lord Chaitanya. And he created a grass hut there. And for four years, he, he vowed to chant 300, 330 theme, I'm sorry, 300,000 names daily so he took a vow, but uh, in order to complete his vow, he continued. And after nine years, he made it a vow to chant one billion names of Krishna, the Maha Mantra. You can see pictures where he's sitting in this grass hut with an umbrella inside the hut. Was the hut during the rainy season would leak water in and he would sit there just chanting, finishing his rounds with an umbrella over his head. It took him nine years to finish that vow. Wow. 
During Chaturmasya, he cooked rice, dried in the sun with ghee and ate it, ate it from the floor. He slept on the hard ground. Very austere. In, it was a debate coming up between Bhakti, Bhakti Vinod Thakur and the Brahmins. It was due to be September 8th for three days in a place called Mindapur in the year 1911. Bhakti Vinod Thakur became sick and couldn't go, and Bhakti Siddhanta went in his place. And before then, he had written this manuscript called Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. So now you can read that manuscript in the form of a book. It talks about the difference between Vaishnavas and Brahmanas. And when he came, he actually defeated all the Brahmanas, and he was glorified for that. And he established that a Brahmana obviously is a very elevated personality and should be given all honor and respect. But unless a Brahmana becomes a Vaishnava, he doesn't have the power to save others. <laughs> and there's many, many wonderful stories in the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Uh, he was so strong in his preaching, even his uh, disciples would get <coughs> concerned. And uh, he, was, he was known for his acts preaching, acts. He would cut away any kind of nonsense. He was fearless. He would never uh, tolerate anything less than pure devotional teachings. And therefore, some of his own God brothers uh, would criticize him. Uh, the, the disciples of, uh, not, not God brothers, but uh, his disciples. Okay? And the ones that found fault with him, they fell down. Prabhupada tells one story where the uh, Mayavadis some Brahmins and others, they were really threatened by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's teachings. And so they made a plot to kill him. So they approached one police officer and said, we are going to do something to Bhakti Siddhanta. Here is 25,000 rupees. I mean, that was a 25,000 rupees in those days, my God. Practically, a rupee was equal to a dollar today. So uh, the police officer said, well, actually, we do engage in such things. But in case, in this case of this saintly person, we cannot do it. So he refused. And then he came to Bhakti Siddhanta and told him, be careful. There are persons who are out to cause you harm. <laughs> So that's how his preaching was. They were so afraid of him that they actually wanted to remove him by killing him. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many other wonderful stories in the life of Bhakti Siddhanta. Of course, in the year 1915, we'll go back a little bit, uh, his father, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, his guru, um, um, Srila Bhakti uh, Gorakishore Das Babaji. Uh, Gorakishore Das Babaji had left in the year 1915. His father left in the year 1914. And that same year, at the end of the year, his father, guru, and Jagannath Babaji appeared in a dream to him along with the Panchatattva. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaitam, Gadadhar, and Srivast, they all appeared into a dream, along with Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, Gaur Kishore Das Babaji Maharaj, Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj, and said, we give you full support and assurance, you continue your preaching, and you, there will be no worldly hindrance which will obstruct your preaching. 
He took heart from that dream and later on in the year 1918, at the age of 44, he sat in front of a picture of his spiritual master, Gorky Shore de Babaji, and, and on March 29th, 1918, chanting the mantras that he had learned from the Ramanuja Sampradaya, he initiated himself into the sannyas order. Sometimes he's criticized for doing that, but there was nobody there. There was nobody to give him sannyas. And he knew without taking sannyas, he would never be able to preach effectively. And so he took that risk of being criticized and he accepted the sannyas order of life. Of course, we know the famous event in 1922 or our Srila Prabhupada, Abhai Charan, met Bhakti Siddhanta and told him, <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta told him to take this message of Krishna consciousness to the Western world. Prabhupada said, it took me 50 years, almost no, 40, 40 some years, 43 years later, to actually execute his order. The Prabhupada was preparing his life to do the work. Oh. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is famous for so many works. He wrote a book, uh, wrote a pamphlet called Being Humbler Than the Braid of Glass. He wrote many, many books on Vaishnav teachings, the principles of Shastrak knowledge, so many books. Um, he established the, uh, um, what was it? Sarjanatoshini. Sarjanatoshini, which is a, was a, a newspaper and, and also the, the Gaudiya, what was it? Nadia Prakash. Nadia Prakash. He established two newspapers to daily publicize uh, philosophical and spiritual teachings, wrote many books, initiated 60 disciples into the order of sannyas, who later on, many of them preached all over India and established temples and diorama displays. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was the initiator of the diorama displays. The dioramas were just more like these little replicas of Krishna's pastimes in the form of dolls, but they were, you know, maybe about, oh, half a meter high. And uh, they were more like made of various types of material and then later painted over to look like different personalities and different leelas of the Lord. And he established that and he took those dioramas to different places and used it as a preaching tool to attract people to Krishna consciousness. He spent large amount of money to bring people to prashadam programs. He would spend thousands and thousands of rupees and uh, have people come and uh, just take prashadam. And then he would hold discourses on Krishna consciousness. In 1925, he organized a parikram with his devotees. <clears throat> and while they were um, going on parikram, they were attacked by rocks from people in general. <clears throat> when uh, they also took shelter of uh, the uh, Radha Raman temple, and it was the Radha Raman Ten Babaji's that gave them shelter at that time. Um, so this is how much his, his preaching was revolutionary. <laughs> Completely revolutionary. He didn't, he didn't mince words. He spoke the truth. 
He stepped on a lot of toes, but he was known. His English and many of his writings were difficult to understand even by those who are, we'll say, born with the English language. His, his erudite English was so well developed that one professor, Professor, uh, what was his name? Professor Southers from the University of uh, Ohio State University, yeah, Ohio State University in Ohio. He became inspired by Bhakti Siddhanta and he challenged Bhakti Siddhanta to, to discuss various things. <clears throat> Bhakti Siddhanta was very respectful and humble and he preached to him very strongly. <clears throat> He preached to him in such a way that the professor was astounded by his knowledge and even bewildered by some of the things he said. But then again, later on, Professor Southers, as he came back to the United States, he wrote him a beautiful article glorifying Bhakti Siddhanta and his teachings. <clears throat> he met governors, viceroys, kings, opened temples, did diorama displays, prashadam distribution, spoke on many themes. He started a theme on Srimad Bhagavatam and in Dhyaram form for over a hundred, for a month and a half in Sridham Mayapur. He was given a beautiful building in 1930 by one of his, what we say, admirers, who was a wealthy merchant. He gave him a huge marble constructed building in the area called Bag Bazaar, and, and they established three sets of Radhadevis in that place. He preached in Jaipur, Kormashetru, Simalchalam, Korvar, open schools. He opened the Bhakti Vinoda Kaur Institute in Mayapur, established deities in Alanath, sent preachers to Delhi to meet. Uh, he met famous Viceroy, Lord Wellington. He delivered lectures on Srimad Bhagavatam at Sukhar Terala, where is the place where Sukadev Goswami spoke to Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Pariksit. Stalled deities in Madras. Uh, so many things. He inspired writings by his disciples. Professor Sanyal wrote one book, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Also commentary on Chaitanya Bhagavan. Uh, his life was really just intense distribution of transcendental knowledge. Um, he had, um, he, towards the end of his life, knowing that he wasn't going to um, going to be on the planet very long. He asked his leading disciples to start, establish a governing boarding commission to manage the affairs of the Gaudiya Math. After he left, <clears throat> they failed to do that. And instead, two prominent sannyasis who were both powerful preachers both claimed to be followed the descendants or the the next in line in Bhakti Siddhanta. And they were fighting amongst each other. The fighting actually went into courts, stayed in courts for decades. Srila Prabhupada our just saw what was happening. That was the dissolution of the Gaudiya Math because they didn't follow Bhakti Siddhanta's instructions to establish a governing board commission. It was also only infighting within the within the moth and everything gravitated down and was practically lost. So Arshila Prabhupada broke from all that, came to the West to fulfill Bhakti Siddhanta's desire to spread Krishna consciousness and around the world and kept the mission of Bhakti Siddhanta alive in the form of this Tiskan movement. It's a great history. I recommend all the devotees to read that. 
1934, uh, digging at the yoga pit where Lord Chaitanya appeared. They discovered a form of forearm deity of a hoaxajil Vishnu. It was the deity that was worshipped by Jagannath Mishra, the father of Lord Chaitanya. And that deity was installed there. You can still see that deity there now. He discovered the site where Rupa Goswami had darshan with the Gopal deity in Mathura. Sent preachers to Germany, to universities, to London, so many places. He was an ocean of transcendental, what we say, uh, uh, activity. So much activity. And of course, in 1935, he met Arshila Prabhupada at Radhakund and told him, if you ever get money, print books. He said, he said, the Murdanga drum, you play it, you can hear it within a range, but the books, the printing press, that is the Brihat Murdanga, the great Murdanga. So that can be heard all around the world. So he told Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, if you ever get money, print books. And Prabhupada followed, followed that. And today we have distributed almost 600 million books. He sent Bhakti Saranga Maharaj to England to meet Lord Jetland. He gave long lectures on Bhakti Vinod Thakur's work called Dain Humility. He established the principles of humility. So many, I'm not reading all of the different things that I have in front of me about his life. I'm just giving some of the PowerPoints here because it's so long. But I want to get into another section of his life and that is to read one article that he wrote, which was called, um, it was called uh, Initiation. So give me a minute and I'll bring up this article. Please listen carefully to this, uh, this thing because it, it, tell, it actually helps us understand deeper what it means to take initiation. And so this is called initiation into spiritual life. I'll read very slowly and carefully so you can easily follow. The ceremony of Diksha or initiation is that by which the spiritual preceptor admits one to the status, admits one to the status of a neophyte on the path of spiritual endeavor. So one, when one takes initiation, they are known as a neophyte. Now they're on the path of spiritual endeavor. The ceremony tends to confer spiritual enlightenment by abrogating sinfulness. It's actually, a, its actual effect depends on a degree of willingness, cooperation on the part of the disciple, and therefore not the same in all cases. I'll read that again. Its actual effect, initiation, depends on the degree of willing cooperation on the part of the disciple and is therefore not the same in all cases. It does not preclude the possibility of reversion by the novice to the non-spiritual state if he slackens in his efforts or misbehaves. So one can go back to material life if they slacken or misbehave. Initiation puts a person on the true track and also imparts an initial impulse to go ahead. It cannot, however, keep one going for good unless one chooses to put forth his own voluntary effort. It's like some people say, well, I'm initiated. That's no. Initiation means beginning. It puts you on the path. Now you have all the tools and you are also able to receive the mercy. Now it's up to you. The nature of the initial impulse also varies 
in accordance with the condition of the recipient. How you receive initiation varies. But although the mercy of the good preceptor enables us to have a glimpse of the absolute on the path of his attainment, the seed that is thus sown requires very careful tending under the direction of the preceptor if it's to germinate and grow into the fruit and give fruit giving tree. Unless our soul of its own accord chooses to serve Krishna after attaining, attaining a working idea of his real nature, he cannot, long, he cannot long retain the spiritual vision. The soul is never compelled by Krishna to serve him. But initiation is never altogether futile. It changes the outlook on the, of the disciple on life. If he sins after initiation, he may fall into greater depths of degradation than the uninitiated. Hmm. Pretty powerful statement. So if one starts to sin after initiation, they can fall even lower than they were before. But although even after initiation, temporary setbacks may occur, they do not ordinarily prevent the final deliverance. The faintest glimmering of real knowledge of the absolute has sufficient power to change radically and for the good, the whole of our mental and physical constitution. And this glimmering is incapable of being totally extinguished except in extraordinarily unfortunate cases. So there are some, that even if you fall, there is still some light in your life and that light can be regenerated again, maybe in the next life or in the life after that and so on. Okay, so the, this, this uh, particular uh, text is about six pages long. <laughs> so I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it's very technical. If anybody would like it, we can send it to one devotee and that devotee can distribute it. I think it's important reading <clears throat> because it really helps you to understand clearly what is initiation what is the responsibilities of the disciple? What are the factors that make initiation what it is? What are the some ways that we can fall from initiation and still think we are initiated? There's so many aspects to this. So we can make this available. Mm -hmm. And now I'll switch to the last part, which is really the disappearance ceremony, where he, and I'll read. On the morning of December 31st, 1936, Srila Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur requested Sripad Bihar, Srihar Maharaj to sing Sri Rupa Manjari, so, authored by Naratam Das Thakur and Sripad Naveen Krishna Vidya Lankar to sing Nam Kirtan. So this is the two, bird, two songs he liked the most. Sri Rupa Manjari Pada and Nam Kirtan is Jasomati Nandana Brajabhada Nagara Gokula Ranjana Khan. In the forenoon, he requested the editor of the Gaudiya magazine to see to it that the Vaishnav Majusha, the basket of Vaishnav vocabulary, would be compiled and published. In his last days, he had specifically requested his disciples to form a governing body commission of 10 and 12 devotees to manage the society, society's affairs. Of course, they never did that. Two of his last statements were love and rapture. Both should have the same end in view, love and rapture. Takur Naratam lived on the principle of Rupa Raghunath. It is good to follow that path. 
to all he announced, he said, please accept my blessings to you all present and absent. Please bear in mind our sole duty and religion is to spread and propagate service to the Lord and to his devotees. Thus the great Acharya, the Simha Guru, the uncompromising Sadhu, the Vaikuntha man, as Srila Prabhupada once described him as a tireless preacher of the pure teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, left this material world uttering the name of Krishna at about 5.30 a.m. on Thursday, January 1st, 1937, and entered the pastimes of the Supreme Lord and have firmly established the foundation of a spiritual movement, which would be carried around the world by his pure servant, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Well, this is a little bit about his disappearance from the world. And Prabhupada writes, <clears throat> I wrote him a letter just practically two weeks before he, did, he departed, asking him, what is my service to you? How can I serve you? And he told me the same thing he told me when I first met, met him. Take this message of Lord Chaitanya and teach it in the Western countries. <coughs> So he did, and this was his reason for appearing in this world to bring Lord Chaitanya's movement around the world. So by the grace of Bhakti Siddhanta, he pushed it, he inspired it, and he created a, a great personality. We empowered a great personality, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, to do the work. And uh, today, we are all benefited immensely beyond our ability to understand what we have received from the mercy of the Supreme Lord through these great personalities. The mercy of the Supreme Lord comes through the great souls. The great souls live to distribute the mercy of the Lord. And Lord Chaitanya is Patita Pava Nahetu, Pava Avatar. He is the most merciful manifestation of the Lord coming in this age to propagate the teachings of Krishna consciousness through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. And from his appearance to now began the golden age where for the next 5,000 years, Krishna consciousness will only increase and spread more and more around the world. It's interesting to note we are in a very interesting time where right now I can say that this uh, this uh, disease that is that is spreading is spreading around the world so fast. I was talking to one doctor yesterday and he's given me some alarming statistics. This was in the UK. Hundreds of people are dying daily in the UK by this uh, coronavirus. People are dying everywhere. It's not some, you know, some hype. It's actually happening. We are at a height of what we say a crisis on the, uh, on the atmospheric level around the world. And so right now, the opportunity to spread Krishna consciousness is so great that we can, we, there are so many people who are looking for answers. And the only answer really is take shelter of the Supreme Lord and the best way to take shelter and the best and most easiest and nicest way, and nicest in the sense that it's easy and it's sweet is to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare, Hare. So we are in a good position. Each and every one of us should think, what can I do to be a part of spreading Krishna consciousness around the world? We should not miss this opportunity. And it's a, a great chance to uh, show, uh, give Lord Chaitanya's message to the world in the most... And as Srila Prabhupada said, and he said this a few times, he said, this Krishna consciousness movement 
will save the world in its darkest hour. That is a direct quote. Prabhupada said it a few times. Prabhupada, our Prabhupada was, he was prophetic. Everything he said that he said that would come true in the future has come true in the future so far. And he gave us many, many statements about how this whole society inside out would become rotten and start to collapse on all levels. We're seeing it now in the form of this pestilence. So you might say, well, we're, we're not talking about, we're not talking about some doomsday prophet. We're talking about the deterioration of human values and the reactions for sinful activities. And it's becoming quite profuse, the reactions. And therefore, the only hope, and this is something that I'm just repeating, I'm not you saying this myself, the only hope is to spread the glories of the holy name everywhere and anywhere. Because if people chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, their whole lives will change. As I mentioned a couple days ago, simply by chanting the holy names of the Lord, one inmate who was living in jail, who had no medicine, no treatment, no care, he simply absorbed himself in chanting after, he, after becoming infected with the virus. He was able to free himself from the effects of the disease simply by chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, his faith was strong. So the holy name is very powerful. The holy name is protective. The holy name is uplifting. The holy name is Krishna himself in transcendental sound. And the holy name has been given the supreme position amongst all spiritual activities by the Lord himself in the form of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So whatever we, whatever way we can, we should think of ways to somehow bring this chanting of the holy name around the world. This life is so valuable. This life is so short. We don't live long. People in previous ages live much longer than we do. Or we don't even live a hundred years. Although this age, they say up to a hundred years is the is the range for life, but people are not even living 70 years, 80 years, maybe, maybe even up to 90. But many people are dying earlier because of the, the contaminations in this age. So life is very short. So we, we should use whatever time we have to become Krishna conscious and take this message in whatever way Krishna inspires us to to preach Krishna consciousness to others and get people to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We should distribute books. But people have a hard time with philosophy nowadays. Their minds are now not very peaceful. They can't understand deeper philosophical teachings. Still, we give them a chance through books to become inspired. But really, the message of purification of one's life comes directly through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. This chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the panacea. The word panacea means the, the, the cure for everything. For everything, for all the problems in the world, just chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So maybe on this day uh, of the disappearance of such a great personality, Bhakti Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, we can make a little bit of a effort to move forward to find ways to, uh, and it all starts with desire. If we have the desire, Krishna will inspire us with the intelligence to how to carry it out. So we should have a desire to somehow or other assist in this great mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's a very 
powerful historical time within the history of the world right now. It's quite cataclysmic and there's a lot of struggling and, and things are not going to change for the better soon. We can we can't expect that the way things are going it is becoming worse and worse and there's always other forms of material calamities everywhere around and these things are also on the rise so uh, and it's all due to the sinful nature of the world's population ever since the technical technological age became the uh, the stage where people live on Technology has taken over everyone's life. Person, impersonalism has become the main uh, focus where personal relationships are ground down to technological, uh, uh, re technological communications. That's all we have. And uh, so ever since that started to develop on the world scene, People are becoming more and more expert at committing sinful activities in so many different ways. I don't want to. I don't want to sound so crazy, but I will. Years ago, when we had cameras, if you took a picture that was considered to be um, like rated X something that was showing parts of a person's body that shouldn't be shown in public, the, uh, the film developers would not develop that film. You couldn't take a picture of anything that was illicit and expect to get your film developed. When we had cameras back, that was even when I was young in the 60s or in the 70s. Nowadays, with all this technology, anything goes. <laughs> so, and I can tell you stories that I hear from people who talk about these things that are quite horrendous and horrible. The way people live nowadays, they have no, nobody follows any kind of rules and regulations. People do what they want, when they want, whatever they want. They live very much just to enjoy sense gratification, that becomes the focus. Sense gratification leads to sinful activities, sinful activities lead to reactions, reactions cause much suffering, suffering spans itself out and causes the whole atmosphere to become polluted. So we're in a very interesting time. It's a good time for the devotees because here's a chance to really come forward and help spread Krishna consciousness in the world and get the mercy of the Lord by assisting the Lord and bringing his mercy everywhere and anywhere. And believe me, a lot of it's being done in different places on the, in the world today. Many, many people are becoming Krishna consciousness every day. Devotees are out there. So each and every one of us should see where, what I can do to make a difference and uh, take part in it, and especially spread the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Okay, I'll stop there, and we'll go into any comments or questions. Hare Bol Guru Maharaj, um, so many wonderful pastimes of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Maharaj, and uh, you know, it, it's wonderful. It's, we are very fortunate to be a part of this glorious disciplic succession. And uh, this is a wonderful way to start our new year. Thank you so much for inspiring yeah. us towards the end. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, no, we're so fortunate to be a part of this disciplic succession. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So if devotees have any questions or you want to share any realizations, please go ahead and mute yourself or maybe use the chat. I can read it out for you. Thank you. Maharaj, um, Hare Krishna. Mansi. This is Mansi. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful, wonderful nectarian um, 
I wouldn't say history, but the the facts about um, the Siddhanta Smriti Thakur, his pastime, because this is the first time I'm hearing uh, about Bhakti Siddhanta. Hmm. Archana, I think we lost her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, Guru Maharaj. Mansi Mataji, she is still here. Uh, her, her, uh, her voice went out. Mansi, yes. Ma Mansi Mataji, are you still there? Maybe that's all she wanted to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, Guru okay. Maharaj, by that time, can we take a question on the chat? No, Marcy uh, says I have more to say. Okay, okay, okay. sure, Guru Maharaj. Oh, okay. yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, now yes. it's better. Sorry. I'm so sorry, yeah. So, yeah, the only time, I mean, Maharaj, uh, attending Kartik Shudha Prabhu's Sangha, we have heard about Bhakti Siddhanta Swari Thakur. And then when I was going through um, the uh, Lilamrit, I got to know about Bhakti Siddhanta Swari Thakur from Prabhupada himself. But the way you have narrated it from the very beginning until the end, it was so, so wonderful. I have not heard it like this. I feel so lucky to be in this um, lecture today. Um, I would definitely like to um, have that document from which you were mentioning about um, initiation, the prerequisite, and actually what we can understand, what we are getting into our responsibilities and everything that's mentioned in that document. I would definitely request if you can share that document with us. I will. Uh, Lavanya, can I send it to you? <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances and wish to share it uh, Yes, Guru Maharaj, sure, I can share it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'll send it to Mother Lavanya and from there she can, you just write to her and then she'll distribute it to those who write to her. Okay, sure. Um, Maharaj, I have a couple of questions. My first question is that Whenever uh, I'm doing a preaching act, uh, knowing my own self also before Krishna consciousness, that whenever somebody, you know, would um, appreciate or would try to glorify a saintly person, then either there is a very minor offense which comes into the mind or you just try to take it very, I mean, I would just try to take it very um, in a way a sahajya would take very lightly, very cheaply, you know, and would not pay so much attention. So knowing my own psychology before Krishna consciousness, I am very reluctant when I am trying to present any of the previous acharyas before Prabhupada. Prabhupada, you know, so many people know Prabhupada and then with Prabhupada, you know, him being a very, very well-known personality, there are many things which we can come up with when we are initially talking about him. But when it comes to Acharyas, the previous Acharyas, like Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur, who is Prabhupada's Guru Maharaj. So, you know, you when you are speaking so much about Parampara, you tend to introduce him also whilst you are preaching because people want to know that when we are talking so much about Parampara, who is uh, Prabhupada's Guru? So I really get confused of how to present Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur so that, you know, because there are so many pastimes, there are so many things that he has done, how to present him in short when we have limited time, how to mm -hmm. present him that we don't end up presenting him in a way that the person might take it very lightly or might not believe us. You know, because some certain pastimes are such that you really need to be a devotee to understand those pastimes. It's not very, very yeah. easy to grasp it. So how do we do that? What would be your guidance? Um, well, the how or what, what do we do or how do we do it? Hmm. Well, one of the things that I can say is that 
and I guess it's an incident in the life of Bhakti Vinod Thakur where he prayed to the Lord to send uh, a personality from his own, what we say, the Sangha, his own entourage, someone who was intimate to help him in spreading Krishna consciousness when he was alone. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's appearance in this world is a divine appearance. It's not coming by way of, you know, somebody wanted to have a child and this person appeared and then he became great. No, he was actually sent by the Lord to do this work. So he's a Mahapurush, a great personality. Um, and of course, another incident in his life is that when he met Arshila Prabhupada, even before they even introduced each other to each other, he was already telling Srila Prabhupada uh, that you take this uh, message of Lord Chaitanya and you spread it to the Western countries. He was giving him a lifelong mission even before they actually knew each other. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was, um, he, he, he had this, he had the power to understand past, present, and future. It's called Trikala Gyan. Uh, he, he could actually understand. And he would always say when people would say to him, you know, Abai, Bhakti Srila Prabhupada, Ardha Srila Prabhupada, why don't we give him this service? Why don't we make him temple president? He would say, never mind. In due course of time, he will do everything. So he knew, although he, Prabhupada didn't go to the West until, you know, at least 20 years after, actually 30 years after Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati left the planet. But he knew that Prabhupada would take his mission and distributed to the Western countries. So uh, you can highlight some of his outstanding uh, statements and his outstanding uh, activities in life to somehow illustrate the greatness of this personality. Getting into the controversial stuff may be confusing for someone who has no understanding of you know, the essence of spiritual life. Let us just show that he, he appeared in this world to do this work. He empowered someone to go around the world. Uh, and uh, these two events really are outstanding in his life. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's... I would suggest you read that three volume uh, thing by Bhakti Vikash Maharaj. It's really quite monumental. It's just an ocean of nectar of the life of Bhakti Siddhanta. It's quite lengthy, three pretty good sized volumes, maybe 400 pages each. But uh, you'll get such an insight of the, his life. It's worth it. I mean, it's, it's worth the time because it's just, it's just basking in unlimited, sweet, uh, historical nectar of how Krishna consciousness was spread all over India at the time. Smaraj, is this available on, online or? The one, the document that you said by Bhakti Vikas Maharaj. It's not a document. It's a three volume, three volumes books. Oh, three it's, books. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, Sri Devi, can you post? Uh, somebody can post where you can get it. Either Sri Devi, if Radha Bhakti's online, somebody can uh, give us some reference. You might yes, check yes. Amazon and see if it's. Available on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So, Maharaj, I will go. Thank you so much. I will go on to my next question. Um, many times 
like as you have mentioned in Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's life, that um, he used to chastise and he used to expose uh, the upper sampradays as well. Not just the Mayavadis and them, but I, I suppose upper sampradays as well. Now, sometimes what happens is not just my question is not just for upper sampradays, but anybody who is not authentic. When we see somebody following those kind of things, whether it's our family or whether somebody who is trying, whom we are trying to preach, should we be, um, <clears throat> should we be as direct um, as we have seen our Acharyas or Prabhupada himself doing that? And the second question is that sometimes you see even within devotee circles, that a lot of devotees, they have, not a lot of devotees, but sometimes you see that devotees have good relationship with people from um, Upper Sampradays or Mayavadis. Then how do we look at those devotees? Do we associate with them? And should we try to draw their attention to these details of how our previous Acharyas and Prabhupada himself has told us to stay away from them? Yeah, speak on the positive that Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Charusrami was very enthusiastic and very um, straightforward of saying that everything you need to know and more is in Srila Prabhupada's books. And he showed it by example also, pointing out different things that were there in Prabhupada's books that we didn't even see. So, yeah, there's no need to go outside because everything Prabhupada gave us is right, is right there in his books and more. It's more than a lifetime worth of study. It's just this, this wandering mentality of wanting to go somewhere else. It's just the nature of the mind to just uh, look for something new, something different. But we had that, the, the mind has to be, what we say, purified through understanding that what we have is everything we need and more. And even what we have, we don't even understand what to speak about, trying to understand something outside. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's prostitution, that's all it is. If you have a nice wife, why go to a prostitute? That's all it is. <laughs> Yeah, but sometimes, Maharaj, you also see that <clears throat> people, um, I mean, even devotees, um, they, so I want to understand from what you said that what can be the subtle mentalities or how do we understand? Because some I have seen that sometimes people just, devotees just want to keep good relations with everybody. So would we still categorize that subtly they are seeking something else? Well, this, um, depending on the relationship you have with the individual, the more intimate your relationship and more easy it is to, to speak directly. The less it is that you have to speak the same thing, but in a less direct way. And that means uh, using words in such a way as to track people's mind to what you want them to hear at the same time, not being harsh or being so negative that it causes them to you know, put up a defense immediately when you start speaking. So that's an art. Mm -hmm. If we learn how to present what Srila Prabhupada has in a way that is pleasing, then mm -hmm. and there's so many ways to do that. Then it becomes, I mean, whether people accept or not, that's up to them. But we have, a, we have, we have everything at our disposal. We just have to learn how to present it. That's all. And then the individual is the person you have to focus on. So you have to know a little bit about that individual. What is your relationship with that individual? If you're somebody is a total stranger, you don't really want to get into heavy preaching. All you want to do is try to explain something that is uh, that in, that might they might be attracted to. That's all. Yes. I think you have mentioned this before and me and Diptesh, we have been um, trying to uh, meditate and trying to implement in our preaching. You have mentioned us um, this before that you have to develop that relationship first before you go into the, even into the preaching. 
Yeah. Otherwise, it becomes they they say, "Well, who are you to tell me?" You know. But if you have a relationship, it's different. Mm -hmm. But also, if you have a chance to speak to groups of people, you can also bring these subject matters up directly. Because you're not talking to anyone specifically, you're talking in general about something very specific. And if people are there, they will hear it and relate it to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That helps, that helps, and it, it does come down to this one thing, this, many times I've seen Diptesh also asking these type of questions, and it does come down to having a relationship and not being harsh, leaving a good impression, and just to speak as much as what the other person can take, yeah. just to summarize. You have to, they have to feel that what you're saying is that you're trying to help them or trying to guide them as opposed to trying to uh, instruct them or try to uh, chastise them. Yes. Yes. Maharaj, um, very quickly, um, I wanted to mention something which Bhakti Rasamrit Maharaj told us once. Uh, on, on this topic of preaching, he mentioned that once he went for a pe preaching program to a college and there were so many students who came up, there were a lot of question answer session and all those things, more than 200, 300 uh, students came up and then uh, Bhakti Rasamrit Maharaj was very excited. This was long, long back, I think 30, 40 years back he was mentioning. And then he said that he was very excited and he took Radhanath Maharaj for the preaching program in the same college. And he was so happy and enthusiastic and looking forward that there will be more number of um, students who will come up. And um, uh, he just told us that, can you make a wild guess how many turned up, how many turned up? And then we made a guess. And then at the end, he said, literally just one student came up. And then, you know, we, we then discussed about that, but basically he also, you know, told us, and then you are reinforcing that to me today, that you have to stay so much detached when you are preaching as well, that it is not necessary that the person whom you are preaching will grasp what you are trying to say. But that doesn't mean that we be harsh to them, but even if you are trying your best to be polite, to leave good impression, just to speak whatever they can, even then, they might not take it up. And that just gives me the sense of learning the art to um, present things, present our guru in a proper way, but at the same time, stay detached of the results. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yeah, yeah when I was in London, I went to um, Imperial College and uh, there was a large group of students there. And I gave a class and it was organized by some of the those students in there. And it was, I don't know, there was maybe about a, about a hundred students or more came to my talk. But there was one student who was really, really intelligent, super intelligent, and he challenged me um, from an intelligent intellectual platform. And I responded and we got into a discussion and then it became so much of a discussion that we had to stop. And then we met after the talk outside and we continued our discussion. But I was able to speak to him straight philosophy because he was, he was intelligent. He could understand the principles I was saying. He might not have agreed with them, but he could understand them. So I I'm just using that as an example that depending on the person, you can speak accordingly like that. He was interested in the knowledge. He yeah. wasn't so much interested in uh, just keeping his own ideas. He wanted to learn. And he had, he had some experience or he had some basis in the philosophy. So it was, and that, but if somebody else would be presented it, I would have to speak a little less direct because they might not have been able to understand or even appreciate. So again, you have to know your audience or try to know your audience. Yeah. 
Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Mansi. Thank you for your questions. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Sorry, Mataji, go ahead. Go ahead, Prabhu. Go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, all glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. Maharaj, what would be uh, your advice if we know that the audience that we are speaking to, uh, so so we have we already know the uh, the audience in the sense that they are following a wrong sect or they are following the wrong principles. For example, they are following a concocted per, uh, person who they have claimed to be God. That whole institution. And how do we preach to them? Do we then directly say that 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 is, I mean, that is a very fine balance. But you you can attack his philosophy without attacking him. Mm. Don't mention the person; they'll take it personally, and then they'll immediately block. But if you take apart his philosophy, then then they can see. Because I sometimes feel that. Uh, Yes, Maharaj, that, that is quite right. But then also not speaking up uh, the philosophy directly when you are there, that's also something not, well, not to be done because otherwise you are accepting what's there. There's an, if, you're, if you're discussing with somebody, there's one thing you should understand. The art of, the art of discussion is not so much presenting your own ideas, but destroying the opponent's ideas. Mm -hmm. That's the art of discussion. You ask them questions and then based on their answers, you take a, you destroy their answers and present the actual knowledge. That's, that's, that's the art of debate. If you're trying to present yourself in opposition of another philosophy, don't be so eager so you see, sometimes you see people, they, they say what they think is right, and the other guy thinks said it, and they just go back and forth. That's the, that'll go on forever. Just ask them what, certain questions about their own beliefs and, and philosophy, and when they answer it, you have to know how to take it apart and defeat it and present the actual understanding. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, if you listen to Srila Prabhupada, that's all he did. He would he would take apart everybody else's philosophy, showing the futility of their ideas, the scientists, the bogus gurus like that. Mm -hmm. There's four kinds of ways to discuss things with people, and it's all four kinds of one. One is called Vitanda. Vitanda you don't want to get into unless you really like, I don't know, <laughs> I can't even give the word. Vitanda means you destroy the other person by dis destroying his philosophy, by destroying his character. <laughs> but nowadays people won't accept that. They'll think you're just, you're just harsh, you're just arrogant, like that. But that's one form of debate, destroy the character and that destroys the, whatever they say. Uh, but then again, that's another thing. But when Prabhupada would hear people come forward and say, well, I'm following this person, Prabhupada said, well, what is his philosophy? And then that person would say, and Prabhupada would hear, listen to it, and then just show the futility of that philosophy. You have to be able to do it in such a way that you're, you devoid yourself from attacking the person, but you're going right to the, to, to the knowledge. That's all. If, you def if you're trying to defeat an atheist, of course, we don't bother with atheists because they're just useless anyway, because you can't convert them anyway. But if you happen to be talking to an atheist, you don't try to convince him of the, of the presence of God. You just show, just show how, how crazy their, 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 their ideas are. That's all. 
by listening to it and just taking it apart. That's all. And that means you have to know the philosophy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, of course, if you don't, you're going to look bad. <laughs> Like I give you an example of what I was thinking of. So they and, and, and there's people who don't believe in spirit. They just believe that everything is matter, and when you die, um, everything is over, and the end of the body means the end of everything. Prabhupada talks about one professor from Russia who we met. He said, "My dear Swamiji, when when this body ends, everything ends." <laughs> Baba said, this is a professor. He has no knowledge. So what would you say to a professor like that? So, well, one of the things you say, well, they don't believe in spirit. They believe only in matter. And matter is temporary. So then you might say, well, in the dictionary, it says that there is a word called eternal. So there is a word called eternal. So how would you describe that word eternal? You would ask them. And then they get stuck because matter is not eternal. There's no way you can say that. So the word is there. What does it apply to? That leads them to another category of existence, which and then you can say, well, eternal means something that's never born and never dies. So tell me, my dear sir, what's something that never born and never dies that's eternal? And then they're stuck. Because the word exists and it has meaning. That's a good example of how, how you can approach the different people who have different philosophical uh, mis misunderstandings by looking at hearing what they have to say and just finding the flaws in it. And that's easy. You can easily find the flaws. When I, when, I, when I went to one prison, I was preaching to the inmates there. And there was one, one inmate there. He was, he was super intelligent. And he, he was a very, actually a popular man within the society, but he had messed up a little bit. He wound himself in jail for a little while. So he didn't like anything I said. So he used that philosophy on me. He kept asking me questions and he wanted to hear my answers so he could use his arguments to destroy my answers. So I could see what he was trying to do to me because I was familiar with that technique. So I didn't answer any of his questions. <laughs> I, just did, I just avoided answering his questions and I just turned it around and asked him questions, that's all. Because people who know the art of debate know that it's not so much establishing your principle, but destroying the other person's ideas. You can do that in a very sweet and very, what we say, gentlemanly way. There's a way that can be done with people in general when it's done with respect, with graciousness, with careful use of, of language and encasing it into very sweet words. You know? That's the art. Yes. Art. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. I'm, I have to say, I don't know the art so well, but I have some understanding of some of the some of the principles that make up the art. <laughs> Guru Maharaj, there is a question on the chat by Devanand Pandit Prabhu. Uh, he says, I have heard that the teachings, books of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur are more for Hindu. And we are advised to better study the teachings of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Is this true? 
Well, he's what he said is is half is correct in one sense, but one part is not. The the, the teachings of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati have been delineated, formulated, and presented to us by Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada did say that we shouldn't so much study and read Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's works, but he did say you should read the books of Bhakti Vinod. He did say, and he, he highlighted a few of the books such as Jaiva Dharma, Chaitanya Shikshamrita, and uh, a few others. But for Bhakti Siddhanta, he said it's, he's too hard to understand. You can get Bhakti Siddhanta through me. But this word Hindu, I don't see, I never saw that connected to that statement at all. So I don't know. So what he's saying is correct in the sense that, uh, yes, Bhakti Vinod Thakur's books are very much relevant because he's preaching to the Western mentality also. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was preaching to the Western mentality at selective time, but in generally he was preaching straight Siddhanta. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, so we should follow that formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. And uh, uh, Aradhana has a question on the Facebook. Uh, she says, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam, thank you for your pearls of wisdom. As a married woman, how to preach to males? Please advise how to proceed if preaching is taken by males in a wrong way, they, they become attracted. They, they become attracted? Yeah, that's what I think she means. Uh, uh, if preaching is taken by males uh, in a wrong way, mm -hmm. that's what I think is, she has written. <laughs> this is a very sensitive question. <laughs> Depends on who those males are. If they're your students, then that shouldn't be hard to figure out. But if they're not your students, then <clears throat> one of the things of the male ego is that males don't like to be instructed by females. <laughs> That's part of the male ego. So even if you're right, <laughs> you may find it difficult to get a favorable response. You have it, yeah, that would require great sensitivity and a lot of sweetness. You have to be super sweet, so sweet that they don't even hear the words, all they hear is your sweetness and then you will have more of a chance to reach them. But if they're not your students, it's, I wouldn't even worry about that so much. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, we are 30 minutes over time, but Vivek Prabhu has a question. Do we have time for that? Yeah, we can go as long as there's questions. Okay, Vivek Prabhu. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj I have one very sh short question, uh, considering time. Uh, first of all, thank you very, very much, Maharaj. Like this class today, like about Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, like so much uh, history and like you covered that in a very short time. So nice, Maharaj, like all the information, like, so thank you very much. Um, like question in Maharaj that uh, he only instructed Srila Prabhupada that teach this to or preach uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, mission to Western people or like that was to all of his disciples, but only Prabhupada could follow. Yeah, he gave them, he gave that, he gave that uh, instruction 
for he gave that uh, direction to all his disciples. As we mentioned, some of them went to London, some of them went to France, some of them went to Germany, some of them went to Burma. But there wasn't much results. There was no results, actually. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati could understand by his powerful spiritual vision that Arshila Prabhupada would do it. He knew he could he knew he would do it. And he indicated that a few times. <clears throat> There's one statement, you'll find it in Bhakti Bhakti Vikash's Maharaj's book, where Bhakti Siddhanta's addressing a whole group of his students, his disciples. And he's talking about this preaching going to the West. As he's talking, our Srila Prabhupada is in, the, is in the audience, but he's sitting off to the side. And so when Bhakti Siddhanta was talking, he moved his head right in the direction of Srila Prabhupada and was looking at him. As he was giving, he looked right at Arshila Prabhupada. Jai, Jai, Shila Prabhupada ki Jai. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, but he gave that message to everybody, all of his disciples. Okay. And some of them tried. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada. Our Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness. Thank you for this wonderful lecture on uh, the Simha Guru, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. I feel so inspired simply by just today's class. On the subject of preaching, however, I'm in a bit of a dilemma, somewhat akin to what Manasi and Diptesh Prabhu were speaking about how to present the philosophy, how to make a dent basically, because I find that, you know, I'm here in the Western world and people are just now vaccine, vaccine. Oh, we are coming up with the vaccine. Like this is the greatest thing, you know, to appear on the horizon when we know that it's meat eating and a, a sinful life and all the wrong things. So I find that at least in my limited experience, I find that talking to anybody, you know, over the age of 25 is just a, just something that's very, almost like a waste of time because their minds are so stupefied with the meat eating and the beer drinking and whatever abominable things they're doing that it just doesn't penetrate their heads even. So I don't know how to explain to people that it is, you know, all this meat eating, which has caused all this infected meat, because it doesn't seem to get into the heads. Not one of them is saying, my goodness, we need to change our lifestyle. We're doing something wrong here, except some of the young people who are very aware of the environmental damage and what is happening to Mother Earth and things like that. I'm able to, you know, make some headway there. But the rest of them, it's like, forget it. You know, they're just too dull headed with meat eating. How can we preach to such people, Guru Maharaj? And that's where we need it the most. Well, it says if you throw uh, if you throw seeds on barren ground, nothing will happen. If you throw seeds on fertile ground, the seeds will take root in the ground, and then the watering process will make the plant grow. <coughs> so um, best to to confine your time and energy to an audience that is more receptive. Don't waste time with people you know are not gonna, you're not gonna take it. If you know that ahead of time, then don't waste time. Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. That is very helpful. Yeah, go for where 
where there is some receptivity. You've had that experience already. Yes, there are some people who are very willing, very eager, really want to know. And there's the other end of the spectrum, which is completely tuned out. So trying to understand where I'm wasting my time and where what I should be my what time. I would, what I would say also is that you are a counselor. <laughs> so as you counsel your students in the area of, uh, what is it? Marriage counseling or like that and other areas. You, know, you can inter interject spiritual principles, Krishna consciousness, uh, chanting like that as part of the, uh, the remedy for solving their problems. Nowadays, people are not averse, generally, are not averse to some spiritual principles, which are also uh, uh, seen as ways to overcome problems. If you present it within that same context. So you're in a good position because you already have a, you already have your shingle out. And people know a little bit about who you are and what you do. You can continue to interject Krishna consciousness within that within that purview, within that uh, you know way that you have to reach people through through these material means. Okay, Guru Maharaj, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that guidance. I, I really needed to hear that. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're in a good position. Guru Maharaj, there are no more questions on the chat. Okay, so we can yeah. conclude here. Yeah, thank you. And I'll send, I'll send Lavanya that, uh, that text by Bhakti Siddhanta. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for this wonderful session today. Thank you for being there to host it. I really enjoy the way you carry the programs through very nicely. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Your mercy. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>